Coming up on One Detroit, we are on the road at the Detroit Policy Conference. I'll go one-on-one -on -one with Governor Gretchen Whitmer, and Nolan and Stephen take civility to a new level. We'll explain. I'm Christy McDonald, and One Detroit is coming up. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. I have a question. Who wants to go first to win? Who wants to grow our business? Who wants to make more money? Who wants more job opportunities? If you want Michigan to compete and become a top 10 state, raise your hand. Together, we've turned Michigan around and started moving forward. Now help us build a stronger Michigan than ever. Raise your hand at strongermichigan.com. Support also provided by the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Detroit Journalism Engagement Fund, and the Bill and Shirley Fox Fund for Leadership and Public Affairs Programming at Detroit Public TV. Hi there and welcome to One Detroit. I'm Christy McDonald. Thanks so much for joining us here at the Detroit Policy Conference at the Motor City Casino. Every year, the Detroit Regional Chamber puts on this one-day event to focus on the city of Detroit. Mayor Mike Duggan will speak, as will Dan Gilbert. There will also be conversations centered around growing talent and mobility. It's the perfect atmosphere for our interview with Governor Gretchen Whitmer. She and I have an in-depth conversation on roads, funding, expectations, schools, and so much more. And then we'll catch up with Nolan Finley and Stephen Henderson to hear more about their Detroit Civility Project. It is all coming up for you on the show. All right, so let's get started with my conversation with the governor. Just a week before she presents a budget, we talk about her plans for the roads, the expectations she's setting up for her term, and her thought process behind some of the biggest decisions she's making. Governor Whitmer, it's great to see you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So go ahead and give us a sense of what the last two months have been like. And I think when you go into a new job or go into a new situation, we all have expectations of what it's going to be. Has something been totally different from the expectation that you had? Well, it's been a whirlwind. On day one, I um, executed a number of executive directives about opportunity within state government and ensuring that we're leveling the playing field. Um, sadly, I've had to make a few phone calls to families of um, service people who, who passed. So, uh, you know, but the, the average day to day is that I get an opportunity to really drive an agenda that is going to solve problems for people. The state budget I'll be introducing on Tuesday. Next week we'll be listening is, very carefully. <laughs> no one's going to be surprised. It's focused on fixing the roads and closing the skills gap. And when we do that, we improve everyone's lives. So I'm really looking forward to doing that. When we talked when you were on the campaign trail, um, I asked you about your leadership style. And you talked about making sure you had the best people in the room and then really listening to what they had to say. And I saw the first couple of weeks that you were in office, you went around to a lot of the state offices and agencies and listened to a lot of the state workers. What were they telling you about how they believe the state is being run right now and, and kind of what the future is? I thought it was really interesting that you did that. Well, you know, I just assumed that it had been done before, and apparently it hadn't. In every department, bar none, there was some state employee who'd worked there for 20, 30 years and said I was the first governor they'd ever met. That the state employees came out and enjoyed the opportunity to tell me some of the challenges they see, but also to sing the praises of other people in their division. And it was really um, inspiring and made me acutely aware of the fact that my success as a governor is totally dependent on their success on the front line every single day. There's 48,000 people in state government who do the hard work of running government. It's not 
the elected officials at the Capitol. It's, it's these people who show up and work so hard to protect us, to serve us, and to help level the playing field. So it was really inspiring. You know, I can only imagine the amount of feedback or the opinions that people have of things that you should be doing first. And what are you hearing most? Is it roads? Yeah, I mean, the roads, when you see the, the freeze and thaw cycle. I mean, this is probably the worst winter, like poster child for roads you, you have right here. Absolutely. And, you know, it has been a tough winter. We had a state of emergency, too, uh, which is something you never anticipate for. But we've got a phenomenal uh, uh, emergency operations center in Lansing that we were on the case. So when we needed to call on people to turn down their thermostats, we, we got reaction that we wanted and we saved um, us from losing energy for people over the worst part of the cold. So this is a, um, a job that's always changing, but I'm gonna stay focused on the fundamentals that got me here, which is fixing the roads and, and closing the skills gap. These are the things that when we do them well, every one of us will benefit. All right, so I wanna talk about roads, I wanna talk about education, I wanna talk about the promise you said of community college and making that accessible for everyone. So let's go ahead and start with roads. The number one thing is everyone says, how are we gonna pay for it? We've seen the reports come out that what, $2.2 .2 billion is what would be needed to get our road system and our bridges and infrastructure back up to where it needs to be. People say, where are you gonna find the cash? So this is a problem which is decades in the making, 30 years, 40 years in the making. It's not a criticism of one person or one party, but our leaders have failed us. They have pretended that we could get by or we could get by on small fixes. And now we've got a crisis on our hands, a crisis that we're all paying for already. You're paying a road tax and I'm paying a road tax. If you live in Detroit, you're paying $860 a year to fix your car. So worst kind of road tax you can pay because it doesn't actually fix the roads. We're in danger traveling these roads. We have bridges with hundreds of supports, temporary supports, that buses full of kids are traveling over or that we're traveling under. It is a crisis waiting to happen and it undermines our, our mobility. So, so is it enough though to convince the legislature to say there's going to be extra tax or are they going to be finding money from someplace else and then that makes people think what programs are going to, is that funding that's going to be pulled from that? Well, we got to pay for it. Even the Senate Republican leader has acknowledged we cannot address the magnitude of the problem without new revenue. That will all be in the budget that I introduced on Tuesday. That's when the real debate will get started. Uh, but I want to make sure people understand we are already paying for bad roads. We're paying in foregone opportunity. We're paying in uh, unsafe conditions that people are getting hurt. We're paying every time we replace our tire or our windshield. And so let's do it smart in a way that actually keeps money in our pockets and makes this a place that we can grow our economy and get investment into our state. And that's not just cheap fixes to or putting a Band-Aid on the problem. So let me ask you about that. When the real debate is going to start after you put the numbers out in the budget, what is your relationship so far with the Senate Majority Leader and the House Majority Leader? So uh, one of the things that I uh, committed myself to during the campaign was to hold quadrant meetings. That's when we have the Republican and Democratic leaders of the House and the Senate meet with the governor, and we've been doing that. We just had another one this week. Um, where we can have an open dialogue about where we are headed. We are not going to agree on everything. We all know that. But we're never going to be able to find common ground if we don't build relationships and stay focused on the things that matter. And so I feel good about where we are headed. It's going to take continuous work, and we're going to have to navigate some tough issues together. But I think we can do it. We're Michiganders. We are not Washington, D.C. We are not, you know, um, the state that's going to show divided government is synonymous with dysfunction. We're going to show that we can make it work, and we can make it for, work for the people we represent. And I think that that's something that's going to have to happen every day to show people that, yes, indeed, they can count on government, because I think there's been a lot of trust lost for people across the state saying, gosh, they can't get anything done. Well, there's no question. And, you know, there are districts, legislative districts in the state where I won by double digits and a Republican got elected to the House or the Senate. Pretty telling. It tells you that people voted for leaders they think can solve problems, and now it's on us to do that. The election is behind us. We've got to show that we are Michiganders first before partisans. And I'm rolling up my sleeves and doing that every single day. All right, let's talk a little bit about education. Two years ago, Governor Snyder put out a 21st century education report. And in there, there was a couple of things. He even talked about we did need more per pupil spending. Um, 
money has been obviously a hot topic of conversation when it comes to investing into education, but it also talked about governance structure. And the recommendation in that report also talked about maybe abolishing the state school board and having more control coming from the governor's office. I'm curious to think, what do you think about that? Would you um, look to implement any of those things? So there were some good stuff um, that was a part of that report. And unfortunately, they weren't able to act on all of it. It is on us to make sure that we fix the education system in Michigan. We used to be the envy of the world, and now our third graders are in the bottom 10 in our country in reading. It's unacceptable, and we're never going to make sure that this is an economy and a quality of life that people come to if we don't fix the education crisis in Michigan. Um, so my budget will have uh, a lot of um, things that we're going to do to ensure that every child is literate by the end of third grade, that every child has opportunity and the wraparound support that they need, that we infuse some common sense and some, some audacious goals. Michigan was the only state in the Midwest that did not have a formalized post-secondary attainment goal until I gave the state of the state and set it at 60%. And I chose 60% because that's where every other state is, is focused. And I said, we're gonna get there by 2030. But to do that, we've gotta get this budget passed, we've gotta change our education system, we've gotta ensure everyone has a path to a high wage skill. That's all gonna be a part of the budget that I'm introducing on Tuesday. And if we get it done, we are gonna have a state that uh, we hold our young people here because they wanna stay here to build a life here and we draw others into the state. Is there any specific state that you're looking at? Is it Massachusetts? Is it what they're doing in Tennessee to try to take some of the things that they're doing that have, have been working there? Yeah, so there's no question Massachusetts does it best when it comes to K-12 education. So we have taken lessons from them. The Tennessee, I'm, I'm glad you raised Tennessee. That's what we modeled the Michigan Reconnect after. That is the opportunity for people in the workplace who have been either displaced or they're looking to upskill within their own job will have another opportunity to get back into the skills that they need to, to do that, to get back in the workforce. So we've got real paths for everyone in this state. If you're willing to work, you're going to have a path to a good wage job in Michigan. And um, we're excited about it. And I know that 2030 is not that far away. Getting to 60% is bold, but it's totally doable. And I think we're up to it. Let me take you back to the governance question. What do you think about the uh, elected state school board that we have right now, their ability to hire the superintendent? Do you think that should change? Should the governor be the one who could help appoint someone to the board? Should there be some kind of change that you take to the voters? So taking something to the voters is not an easy thing to do. And so I am watching very closely what they're going to do with regard to hiring a new state superintendent. They're very early in the process. I am understanding that there are a number of really kind of interesting candidates who've asked to be considered and so I'm going to let that play out before I tell you what I think of where we need to be headed next. I want to give the next state superintendent the ability to see if they can um, make the State Department of Ed uh, the kind one that we think we deserve. Um, in your state of the state, you talked about community college and making that accessible for all students across the state of Michigan. That's an ambitious goal as well. That's going to take some funding. It is, but you know what? It is small compared to the return that we are going to get for it. When every one of us has a path, whether it is into the trades or a debt-free community college degree or an affordable four-year degree, that's when we get the kind of concentration of talent that strengthens our economy and improve everyone's, um, you know, bottom line. And so it's uh, something that I think, of course, every, you know, it, it will have a price tag, but it is absolutely um, a no-brainer when you see what it means in terms of individual opportunity and also what it means for our state. Yeah, I think it's changing the mindset for people that you have to invest to get that kind of return. All right, speaking about investment, um, FCA made a huge announcement this week, obviously, yeah. investment in the city of Detroit. Um, the state will be giving some kind of incentives? We will. Uh, they've already started that conversation before I came into office. This was started under the Snyder administration. I think that the MEDC is working hard to make sure that it is the kind of investment that will be transparent, that we will see what we are getting for it so the taxpayers can have confidence in it, but also that ensures that FCA continues to grow here in Michigan. This is $58,000 a year jobs, 6,500 of them, a real investment that impacts not just Detroit, but Macomb County and Monroe County and all of the um, surrounding areas as well. This is a, an incredible thing for Michigan and we feel really good about it and at the strategic fund meeting in a couple weeks we'll really have a much better idea of what those incentives will look like so everyone can see uh, what we're 
what we're doing. You know, and I think when you say everyone can see, because when you say incentives, that brings everybody back to Amazon. Sure. And the, and the controversy that people have had with how much incentive do you give a business here? And then how much are you paying down the line? Are you really getting that return? So I guess philosophically, how do you feel about incentives for business? Um, would that be part of something that you would grow here in Michigan? Do you think that we should be giving businesses more incentives to come and relocate? I've always believed that we should have uh, robust tools in our economic toolbox. I also believe that we better be able to tell the taxpayers what it is that we've offered, what it means in return, and to hold companies accountable to make sure they make the investments, whether it's in job growth or it's investments in real property or in communities. These are important pieces of it. So I don't per se say any, they're bad or good, but they've got to be legitimate. We've got to be able to tell the taxpayers this was something that was worth um, not collecting taxes or, or, or promoting something in particular. I think we can do that. I want to talk a little politics with you. Um, you're very active on social media, and, I, and it's been actually, it's been fun to watch. It's been interesting to watch. You have two Twitter accounts, so one kind of the formal and, and informal, and you kind of threw out to all the candidates for 2020, come to Michigan, come and listen to what we have to say. What do you think it was that candidates didn't listen to or what they should be listening to more of when it comes to, I guess, what we're, we're thinking about here in the Midwest? So I was just in Washington, D.C. for the National Governors Association meeting, and I did a lot of national press, and they kept saying, "What? You know, give us the secret to the Midwest. What is give this?" I said, "There's no secret sauce. Come and talk to us. Yeah. Listen to what people want. Don't sit in Washington D.C. and tell us what Midwesterners want. Get into Michigan and talk to people. That I believe is what kept me focused on the things that matter in the election, and we're going to tether me to the issues that solve problems for people. Every candidate should come into Michigan and learn and listen." We're an important state in this election, and every one of them, Republican and Democrat, better come here and learn about who we are and what we want to see and what we expect from our president. So uh, if those candidates came in, what do you think the top three issues would be that people would mention to those candidates? I, I don't know if people would separate out what they confront every day when they tell me that to fix the damn roads or to clean up drinking water or to close the skills gap and fix education, but I have a feeling that uh, the presidential candidates would hear a lot of the same. Um, it is, uh, a campaign is a great opportunity to engage with people in a personal way. It is hard, it takes time and energy and travel, but it's absolutely critical. It's critical not just to a successful campaign, but to a successful uh, tenure. And I think that's something that you can't buy, you can't pull, you can't read and assume you know, you got to show up. And people want to be heard. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that's the bottom line. You know, I want to finish off with much has been made and written about the fact that the four high office holders in the state of Michigan are all women. How do you think that that makes Michigan look? And how do you kind of put that in perspective in terms of leadership in our state in 2019? I think it's incredibly exciting. I talk to and meet people all the time who tell me their daughter or son w was inspired by this last election. Uh, I, you know, I, we all got here from a different path. It wasn't like we joined forces and said, let's all women be together and win this thing. Um, I think the candidates who worked the hardest won. And now we got to keep working hard to make sure that we um, solve problems and, and fix the issues that we see. That's what it's all about. And I think it tells the, the, Michi you know, the people of Michigan and the world that if you're willing to work hard and you do what you say you're going to do, you've got real opportunity in this country. And that's what we should ask for and demand of anyone in public service, but probably anyone uh, you know, that we know. Okay. Governor Whitmer, it was so good to see you. Thanks for stopping by. And we will be watching the budget presentation. And so I'm sure we'll have some more questions for you along the line. <laughs> I'm sure you will, and I look forward to it. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, so let's catch up with Nolan Finley of the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson of American Black Journal as they try to get civil when it comes to politics and explain to us the Detroit Civility Project that they're talking about here at the Policy Conference. So I can't think of two better people to talk about civility. Someone explain to me the Detroit Civility Project. Nolan, take your crack. <laughs> well, what we're trying to do is, you know, Steve and I did an exercise a few years ago where we did NPR StoryCorps where we tried to figure out how two people uh, can come to different opinions, you know, look at the same facts and come at, to different opinions. And, you know, what we did is try to talk to each other and figure out 
the experiences and values and background we each apply to the same set of facts to reach our opinions. Yeah, yeah but the thing is though, it feels like you guys have taken the time to know each other. You are now longtime friends people would consider, but I think when you engage with any kind of debate with people, the people don't really have an idea of where people come from. But that's the point. They don't, and, and I think one of the lenses that's important to view this through is the lens of listening and like really listening, not listening to someone and thinking, here's what I'm gonna say back to them when they're done, but really listening to try to understand what it is they're saying and why. Where does it come from? Why does this person think differently about these things than I do? What in their background might explain that? I think uh, Nolan and I, over time, have, have come to, to be able to do that with each other. Uh, which explains not only the working relationship we have, but the fact that we can be friends as well, right? That that doesn't that disagreement doesn't take over the entire relationship. So how do you spread this to an audience like this that then will hopefully then take it to their workplaces well, in government, politics, and the like? Well, that's what we're asking folks to do between now and Mackinac. You know, the chamber is going to match people of different opinions up uh, between now and Mackinac to have these sorts of discussions, not to argue about politics, not to to debate their differences, but to find out where each per, who each person is and how they form their opinions so that you get to know folks before you start making assumptions about them purely based on their politics. So who are you picking from? Just people who have come to the conference? People who sign anybody, who, anybody who wants to do it. Uh, and we would hope that a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds uh, and a lot of different uh, areas of work will do it uh, because I think I think it's an eye-opener when you really sit and sit across from somebody who does disagree with you and listen to what they say. It's hard not to come away with a really different impression of, uh, of that difference between you. Well, people think they know another person because they know their political views. Yeah. And that's just part of who a person is. And we, we, what we're wanting to break down is where we are today where folks won't have difficult conversations with each other or simply avoid each other altogether. And, you know, we don't think that's healthy. Yeah. And that'll do it for One Detroit. Thanks so much for joining us. Make sure you find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We're there. We'd love to hear from you. Plus, we'll be back next Thursday and taking a closer look at Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan's State of the City Address. Hope you'll join us for that. I'm Christy McDonald. We'll see you next time. Take care. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Maryland cabinets, and their brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. I have a question. Who wants to go first to win? Who wants to grow our business? Who wants to make more money? Who wants more job opportunities? If you want Michigan to compete and become a top 10 state, 
raise your hand. Together, we've turned Michigan around and started moving forward. Now help us build a stronger Michigan than ever. Raise your hand at StrongerMichigan.com. Support also provided by the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Detroit Journalism Engagement Fund, and the Bill and Shirley Fox Fund for Leadership and Public Affairs Programming at Detroit Public TV.